Let's pray. Father, as we come to you prayerful, praying, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, that's the posture that we are in right now. Lord, I pray also that you would even in this moment give us upturned hearts and minds that while we are all sitting here quietly are at the same time rejoicing that we stand in your glory, that we stand before you, the Holy One, that we stand in your glory. You have done great things, you mighty King, you. Marvelous things in our sight. Things that should cause us to, with mouths open, wonder. How is it that we can stand in your glory before you, the Holy One? But it's true. And would you cause us now, as we, as we pray and say thank you, even silently say thank you, would you cause our hearts to sing and to, and to rise and to run and to, and to rejoice? You have done something marvelous. You've opened the door into your throne room, invited us in, and we stand in your presence. Thank you. And Lord, we are a people here that are gathered to hear and, and, and to grow, and we pray that you would speak and grow us. We're yours. We're yours by your will and by your power. We are yours for your good ends. And so we ask you then, would you continue to take charge of our lives and grow us towards you, to change us and mold us and, and make us whole, fill us and smooth out the rough edges, close in the gaps, continue your work on us, God, for our great good. This passage this morning, Lord, is, is a, I think, a passage of encouragement and good news. And I pray that you would cause it to fall on us in, in perhaps a, a refreshing and, and enlightening way, maybe in a familiar way. Maybe this is all familiar information. But if so, Lord, would you cause it to rest on us in a way that encourages and uplifts, grows in us thankfulness and hope. You've done something marvelous in making us yours. You're continuing to work in us, and I say thank you for that and pray you would continue that work now. Make your word clear to us. Cause your spirit to move through the room and have his way in our hearts. Would you give him authority, even in this moment, to change individual people in this room, sitting in blue chairs here right now? Would you give him authority to change them? Would you commission him to work in him and in her and in those ones to, to grow and to change? That we would be different. That we would experience your good. That we would stand in your glory amazed. That you would be honored by what we have become by your power and that we would enjoy it and delight in it and sing your praises because of it forever. Spirit of God, have your way in this room now, I pray. Make clear the words that I will say. Make them your words. Hide and cover over what is wrong and confusing and highlight, illumine, cause to run and to stick what is good and helpful. Make your word clear. Illumine Christ for us. Build us up as worshipers, as thankful people. Build your church and honor the name of Christ, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We turn our attention this morning to Luke chapter 3 and the conclusion of the ministry of John the Baptist. The last two weeks we've been considering what John did and what he said as he labored to prepare a people for the coming Lord. 
He baptized people in the Jordan River as a considered thoughtful expression by individual peoples. They heard him talk and they thought it through and they considered and were baptized as an expression of a turning, of a decisive turning of themselves from self and I'm okay to God in need, in humble repentance. I have need for you, giving myself to you. Particularly, I have need for you to forgive my sin. Called people to do that. Baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Proclaimed that Messiah was coming and approaching and that all would see God's coming salvation. And even at the same time, in the same moment, this is verses 7 to 9 last week, they would see in the same moment his coming judgment, his coming wrath. Because what he's talking about, to use a phrase, is the day of the Lord. The day in which God saves and judges both. God extends, if you will, in that day two hands. A hand that is a fist around a rod of iron and a hand that is open and pierced with a nail. And which hand falls on you depends on how you respond to the call, repent and turn to God for forgiveness of sins. That was his message, what he was doing. And as people heard and responded, many then said, okay, now what next? And this was verses 10 to 14 last week. Okay, having heard that, having turned to him and received from him mercy and forgiveness, what do we do now, day after day, as we await his coming? And what John said, essentially, was love your neighbor as yourself. The fruit that matches a heart that's turned towards God and is surrendered towards God in humble repentance, the fruit that matches that is the fruit of love towards neighbor as self. The fruit of doing justice and loving mercy in the world seeking to do good to those around us, loving our neighbor, which is possible now for those of us who have turned to God because we can now be content with what or with whom we have, with Christ. That was last week. So we've seen a summary of what he was doing and some of what he was teaching, and now in this finishing section about John the Baptist, we see him talking very briefly about the one who's coming, about the coming Messiah. Verses 15 and following, we get this one final element. He's going to describe to us Christ in some ways, and in some ways that are kind of a comparison of the Christ to John himself. So here's the, here's the main point in verses 15 through 20 this morning. I'm going to put it in this sentence and then work towards it with a couple of observations. But here's my main point. The coming Christ, says John, the coming Christ is better than John, both in his being and in his baptism. The coming Christ is better than John, both in his being and in his baptism. And by better, I mean better in the sense of superior, greater, and in the sense of better for us. He's better in that he's higher, he's superior, and he's better for us because of his being and because of his baptism. Those are the, as you might guess, the two observations. That's where those, that's going to go. But let me read the passage first. This is, John, this is uh, Luke 3, verses 15 through 20. As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water. But he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. It's our passage, it's the conclusion of John's ministry. Verse 15, as well as verse 19, reflects some of the the reasoning and some of the expectation and the reasoning behind the expectation in the people's hearts as they 
kind of tried to make sense of John and what John was and what he was doing. He's preaching about the day of the Lord. He's preaching about salvation and judgment. He's baptizing. He's calling people to turn towards God. And importantly, he's publicly taking on corrupt, evil rulers like Herod, calling them out on all kinds of stuff, not just Herodias, but repeatedly calling them out. And then John's response to him is to throw him in, I mean, Herod's response to him is to throw him in prison. So what they're seeing in John is a remarkable ministry that is 400 years new. What I mean by that is for 400 years, they haven't seen this sort of thing going on. God's been silent. But now what they're seeing is someone like a great prophet of old who's who's preaching and who's acting and who's being treated by corrupt rulers just like the old prophets were. And people began to think one by one by one, whoa, this is something. And as enough people thought, whoa, this is something, collectively they began to think, is this something the thing? And is this guy who is someone the one? We've been waiting for something and someone, and here is a remarkable character. Here's a remarkable preacher and prophet. Is he the Christ? Is this, he's talking about the dawning of the day, is he the one? And verse 15 tells us, they were so impressed, they began to give serious consideration to this possibility, and 16, John says bluntly, not hardly. And then he talks about the one who is coming, the Messiah. Now, he doesn't quite know this is Jesus yet. Find that out very shortly. But he knows Messiah is coming and is coming soon. And eventually, of course, the ministry of Jesus takes off and John declines. John is imprisoned and killed. And Luke presents this piece. You might wonder about why does he talk about it now? It is chronologically out of order because he's trying to close off John for us as he's moving into Jesus. If you read this in other Gospels, this, this happens much later. The imprisonment and the killing of John happens later. Luke's closing off John's ministry here and underlining for us, he had a remarkable ministry, but ultimately a ministry that was about preaching good news because it's pointing forward to the Messiah who's coming, coming right quick, right after him. So, Two points that John makes here in this final section, this good news. I'm going to make two observations from them. One about the being of the one who's coming, better than John. And one about the baptism of the one who's coming, better than John's. So here's my first observation. I'm presenting them as good news because this is God's blessing these, these two things we're going to look at, they are God's blessings to us. So good news, God's mighty king has come into the world for us. Good news. God's mighty king has come into the world for us. Verse 16, John answered the speculation about whether he was the Christ by essentially denying it by saying, I baptize you with water. And to get the emphasis, we could throw in the word only. I baptize you only with water. But there's another one coming who is mightier than I. He who is mighty, who is strong, who is powerful. This is the focus of this first section here. We need to think about this. Mightier than John. John realizes the people are seeing in him a great work of God, and he wants to clarify this is nothing like the might you will see in the Messiah who is coming. In the Old Testament, God's salvation is repeatedly. When, when God acts to save, to rescue, to deliver, he acts to redeem, it is repeatedly tied to words like strong and powerful and mighty because that salvation is always set in a context that is realistic. It is a context of rescue. God is a rescuer from situations that are actually very difficult. 
We are, we are not. We do not live in the world. We are not a people who are, you know, kind of in need of a helping hand. A little leg up. A boost. We need to be rescued. In, in, in situation after situation after situation, he deals with people who are terrible enemies and, and diseases that are deadly and sin and suffering and just general evil in all of these types of situations to which there is no human solution, at which the odds are insurmountable. In those situations, God in power and in might and in great strength acts to deliver and to redeem. That's how God sets himself up. I am this kind of redeemer, not just a, a helpful guy. I am mighty. Watch this. I am strong. Watch this. I am omnipotent. Watch this. That's how God saves. And in particular, he clarifies for us, that's what the Messiah will be like when he comes to bring the salvation. Consider one passage, well-known one, an important one. Consider Isaiah chapter 11. A familiar one, important. He's talking there about the coming Messiah using the language of the branch, the root of Jesse. And he says there in Isaiah 11, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. A branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might. This is the Messiah. The branch of Jesse, the family of David, and the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of might, will rest upon him. So among other things, he will be mighty. The might of God himself. The might of God himself will rest on Messiah. I'm not worthy to untie the sandals, the strap on his sandal. John's using imagery there of, of household slaves. And the lowest slave in the household would be the one who would be assigned the task of untying the sandals of visiting guests or dignitaries. And John's trying to set up a ladder here. He says, here's me, and you look at me, and, and you are tempted to think I might be the Christ because you see in me great touch of God, great power at work in me. Well, above me would be someone worthy enough mighty enough, high enough, exalt enough to untie the sandals of the Messiah. Whatever you see in me is nothing like the might of God, by, of the exalted status that you will see in this coming one. He is, put in whatever superlative you can think of, he is God's long-promised, great, high, exalted, majestic king. I realize I'm talking about the might of God and the power of God and the omnipotence of God to, to people who, you in, in, to a great degree, you kind of get that already. And, and I, I know that. I, I get that. But what I'm inviting you to consider is might. Might. All might. Power. The might that spoke everything into existence that is, that just said, let it be, and it was, in vast complexity and intricacy and perfection from nothing. That power, that might, is in the hands of, rests upon this Messiah who has come for you. For you. John is at work. John, sent by God, is at work to prepare a people, remember, for the coming Lord, to call us to turn to him in repentance because he wants us to turn to him to receive because this one is coming to be received by you. He is not just coming abstractly just to kind of be here. We could hear about it, like the president arrives, visits Utah, and jets away, and we heard about it in the news. Hey, the president was here. Nice. 
but irrelevant. No, he is coming. This mighty one is coming here, has come here for you. To be received by you. And you prayerfully have been prepared to receive him so that it is a happy encounter. This is meant to be good news. Consider this. Why is this good news? You know, what it says is, in verse 18, that John, with a lot of other things, preached good news. This is good news too. Why is this good news? The mighty one has drawn near to you for you. With all of the might of God on him for you. That is good, good, good news for you. You who stand in need. People of God, your Savior has all of the power of God at his disposal for you, which means that he can and will, can and will, surely, effectively, accurately, in a timely manner, save you from whatever. From whatever. He can and indeed, first and foremost, John is, is really clear about the great need for forgiveness of sins. First and foremost, it means that he can and will actually, effectively, permanently redeem you from sin and wipe off of you all guilt to wash you clean. And on top of that, he can and will do any and all all things necessary to put down, to hold back, to take off, to remove, to suppress whatever it is that would threaten to curtail, to limit, to destroy your enjoyment of God forever. This is such good news. It might not be good news for you until you realize, ah, and in those moments of your anguish and of your crying and of your loss and of your emptiness and of your weakness, to find one mighty for you is the best news you can possibly hear. There is no human being, there are no powers, there are no governments, there are no enemies that you face, there are no diseases, there are no, no troubles that can separate you from this one in all of his might, in his determination to carry you into good. No evil powers. He casts out, he throws down, he mocks the demons themselves at will as he pleases. They have nothing on you. And best of all, your own sin and your own sinful thoughts and your own desires and your own fickleness is nothing compared to his powerful determination to do you good. This is perhaps best of all. Because there are, time, there are times, I was talking about this in, in life training class this morning, there are times we talk about the Christian life as two steps forward and one step back. And that is so optimistic. The Christian life for many of us at many times is 10 steps forward and nine steps back. We don't have 50% growth, we have 10% growth. And in the times when you get the nine steps back, and does not from, from somewhere out there, who knows where, but well, we know where, from an accuser, from an enemy of your soul, does there not come against you, you wretched loser, you failure, you? And even from our own selves, does there not come, this is hopeless, my goodness, I keep fighting against the same intractable sin and the same weakness, the same temptation got me again. Ugh. And from those around us, does there not come some sense of, whenever you get your act together, come back and talk to us and maybe you can do something useful. From spiritual forces, from the world around us, even from other Christians, and, and from our own selves, there comes on us a sense of 
failure and loss and loss and failure and inadequacy and weakness and just despair and hopelessness. And the good news is that the mighty king in might, that is, in might, will not let you get away. The ten steps forward and the nine steps back will yield plus one. It will. The twenty steps forward and the nineteen back will yield plus one. And he will and he is determined to carry you on. You are a new creation in Christ. He lives in you and he will never leave you nor abandon you nor forsake you nor turn away nor growl at you nor cast you out. Is he happy with your sin? Of course not. He's a good father. So of course he's not happy with your sin. But he deals with us in kindness leading us to repentance and in might actually accomplishing it. When? How? I don't have any idea. He's far wiser than we are. But he has begun a work in you and he will not quit. And he will win. He will win for you personally. He will win for the church. His bride will be cleansed, pure and spotless for the groom on that day. We look out at a world that is is full of trouble. A mighty, mighty Savior has come, and he will save. This is good news of great joy. He does all that he pleases, and he is pleased to do you good, to do us good. Now, My manner here has been one of might. Say it like that. Maybe, depending on where you are, I need to say it like this. He is mighty. A little softer tone. He is mighty. Because it is possible, it is possible that you sit there, a, a bruised reed about to break, and even hearing the words come out with a little bit of growl in him is the last blow. So, Maybe let me say, let me fan into flame here. He is mighty for you. He really is. He really, really, honestly has all the power that is ever going to be needed. And he really, honestly is determined. I know you can't see how. I, I know you can't see how. But he really, honestly is determined He's not going anywhere. He's not going to leave you. And he will deliver you to good. This is good news for us. God has sent a mighty redeemer, which means redemption actually is accomplished in Christ for us, his people. And he is this mighty one. It's important for us to know in order to understand the next point. He is so mighty because of the power of the Holy Spirit of God on him. I mean, think a little bit. We need to understand something because we know a little more than John did at this point. So we should acknowledge something. Then we got to go forward and then got to go backwards here. We understand that he's talking about Jesus. He doesn't even know that at this this point right here. And furthermore, John doesn't understand all that Jesus will be and do. He doesn't understand how forgiveness of sin is going to happen at the cross. He doesn't understand how atonement will happen that will wipe away sin. He doesn't understand that. He doesn't understand even, here's to the point, that the Messiah is the mighty king of glory because the Messiah is God himself. John doesn't get that either. John does not understand fully God and fully man. 
He very clearly, though, understands fully man. And when John talks about the Messiah as God's mighty king, he means that's because Messiah is amazingly, uniquely, marvelously, super abundantly endowed with the Holy Spirit of God. See the connection here. He is God's spirit-empowered ruler. He is the man of the spirit, par excellence, we might say. If we like for Francophiles. Remember Isaiah 11. There's the Messiah there in Isaiah 11. I already referred to that. He is the one on whom the spirit of God rests the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord because the spirit rests on him. And he shall not judge by what his eyes see because the spirit rests on him. And he goes on. But here's the point. Messiah is the powerful, mighty glorious deliverer because of the work of the Spirit on this true sinless man. Now, we know more. We know he's also fully God. At this point right here, what John is saying is good news. The Messiah in the power, in the might of the Spirit will come. And we're never going to be such true, sinless people. We're never going to be that in this world. Okay? We're not. We are fallen. We are sinners. We're never going to be true, sinless people. So Jesus is unique. But that Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, of wisdom and understanding and counsel and might and knowledge and fear of the Lord and delight in God, that Holy Spirit, guess where he is now? Not only resting on Messiah. But by Messiah, poured out on us. Follow this. John is saying, the mighty king, because of the spirit of God. And then that mighty king takes the spirit and says, here, to us. He pours out the Spirit on the world. And that's the second point. So the first point is about his being, good news. He is mighty, sent for us. And here's the second one. Focusing on what he does, baptism. Good news. He is mighty to pour out on the world the Holy Spirit who is God's fire. Good news. He, Messiah, is mighty to pour out on the world the Holy Spirit, who is God's fire. He is mighty in every way conceivable, applied to every situation we can think of, as we did try to just think of a few situations and a few challenges, a few problems and the deliverance that we need. He is mighty in all of those ways. His might has no limits, but in this passage, it is applied in a particular way. His might, that is. John is saying, no, I'm not the Christ. I'm a nobody, a lowly nothing. I'm just a man who baptizes with water. So, What he's going to say is that the one who's coming in is mighty. He's mighty because he's baptizing in a different way with a superior baptism. You call me, might be John might put it like this. You call me the baptizer. Let me tell you, the one who's coming, he's a baptizer. Middle of verse 16. I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. There's the better baptism. That shows the might of the baptizer. And we need to be careful in in thinking about this baptism in spirit because the words are similar to other things 
in the scriptures and other things that Christians talk about. So we need to be first clear what we're not talking about. Because of the wording, we might be tempted to think about the baptism of the Spirit in the sense that some Christians talk about it in relation to salvation or relation to spiritual gifts, relation to some of the miraculous gifts. There's a large field of discussion about baptism of the Spirit, and that's not what we're talking about here. Because in that field about salvation and gifts and things that happen over there to Christians, the point is to Christians. Everybody in that context discussing the baptism of the Spirit, even when they disagree with one another, is talking about something that happens only to Christians. That's a separate discussion. Here, John is talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit upon all the world to carry out his ministry, the ministry of the Spirit in the world. So we look closely at this and follow what he's saying because he's telling us something important about the Spirit when he ties the Spirit to fire. Fire is a common image in the Scriptures for two things. The fire of judgment, and we see that referred to then in the next verse, unquenchable fire at the very end of the verse. The fire of judgment and the fire of refining. The refiner's fire that burns away dross, purifies. It's commonly used for both, the fire of hell and the fire, fire of refining. John says that the mighty one, this Messiah, is about to conduct a baptism of the world. He will baptize you, you all, all people, with the Holy Spirit and fire. One baptism, water versus this baptism, one baptism of all of the earth, and it is a spirit, fiery baptism. So, which image is it? Is it the image of the fire of hell and judgment? Or is this the image of refining and cleansing? Which image is in view? And verse 17 tells us, yes. Both. He is a fire for judgment and for refining. 17 changes the metaphor, uses a common word picture, changes the metaphor to explain what he means in 16, what this one act of baptizing is about. This mighty baptizer in verse 17 is about to execute one action. He's about to thresh grain. He has his winnowing fork in his hand. He's, he's grabbing another image that's extremely common, extremely familiar to them. Threshing grain. There would be commonly a big floor and grain would be harvested. You think you see the whole, the whole stalk with the, the head at the end and the kernels there put on the floor. But of course, it's all mixed there together. It's all combined. And so it has to be beaten, beaten, crushed out, threshed, which of course separates and refines the kernel and makes it useful and sets the chaff broken away from the kernel. It separates. But then, of course, it's still all piled there together. So what they would do is they would create a breeze of some sort across the floor and then with the winnowing fork, chuck this pile into the air just a little bit. The lighter chaff blows away. The heavier kernel that's been separated out from the chaff falls to the floor. All that's left then is to sweep up the grain put it in your barn, and go around and collect all of the garbage and burn it. And your floor is clean. And the chaff is gone and the grain is made useful. Messiah is about to do that. He's about to thresh. That is, he's about to baptize with a fiery spirit baptism. which will be both the bringing of salvation and the bringing of judgment. It's the day of the Lord again, like John's always been talking about. But the unique emphasis here is the role of the Holy Spirit. Messiah is going to come and bring the day of the Lord 
But really what I'm talking about, says John, is Messiah is going to come and bring the Spirit. He will bring the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit poured out on the earth will bring deliverance and will bring judgment. He will bring a cleansing and a purifying and a, a burning away of dross and he will bring a destruction of all that opposes God. Jesus talked about this at the very end of his life before the cross. John 14, 15, and 16 are very focused discussions about the coming ministry of the Holy Spirit. When he would be poured out, Jesus said, I'm going to send the Spirit. Come with the day of Pentecost. And in a new and powerful way, he will fall on all of the earth and will do his work of convicting the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. I'm going away, the Spirit will come and he will cover all of the earth and will make clear, will develop in the hearts of people convictions. That is sin. This is righteousness. There will be a judgment, a reckoning of those two. That is sin in me. That is righteousness lacking in me and there will be a reckoning. The Spirit will come and he will carry out that work in all of the earth. And he will come also, in those chapters Jesus talks about, he will come also to be an illuminer, to be a, a guide, a helper to the people of God. He will open their eyes to truth. He will give them power to walk in righteousness. He will create communion between them and the Father. This will be the work of the Spirit when I pour him out on the earth. And that happened at Pentecost. In great power, Jesus, Messiah, sent the Spirit to us. This is good news. This is good news. What we should be thankful for because it is how you, if you're a Christian, it's how you were saved. If you ever, if you ever become a Christian, if you already have, or if tomorrow or in this next five minutes you become a Christian, that is because of the work of the Spirit of God in your heart to make you aware, to, to open you, to, to, to alert you to sin, and to alert you to the need for righteousness, and to show you what that is in a way that is more than just intellectual, but is perceived and to show you Christ as a beautiful and glorious and mighty Savior, to point you towards the cross and to give you faith to believe. That is the work of the Spirit of God on you that would not have happened had mighty Messiah not poured him out on us. That is good news, good news, good news. And if you ever, and as you grow, as ten steps forward and nine steps back becomes plus one, that is because of the ministry of the Spirit in your life it has worked as a refiner on you to mature you and grow you. That is good news. And if and when the world is totally wiped clean of all evil and all trouble and all misery and everything is made right, that will be because of the Spirit of God. It is good news that he has sent him to us and that he is at work even right now in you and in us and out there. And we must be honest that this is not good news if you are determined to try to resist it. This is the mighty one. And he is too strong for you. Watch that thing in your heart that says, I don't like that. Why not? Watch that thing in your heart that says, no! Why? Why not? What's, what's wrong? What's wrong with a God who says, everything good and everything just and everything righteous and everything that is full of love and of mercy and of grace, that's what I'm for. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that that's not what we're for. 
what happens there is a confrontation that our hearts resist because we're not actually for everything that's good and right and just. We're for everything good and right and just in my eyes. And he won't have that. When you say no to him, when you resist him, you resist him out of pride, not wisdom. This is good news for all who in humble repentance turn to him, and it is not good news for those who in pride won't. I plead with you, turn to him. The cleansing of the world, the clearing of the threshing floor will happen, and people will be divided by the Spirit's work in one of two ways. And right now, perhaps he speaks to you to convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment and to call you to flee from the unquenchable fire into the safe home of God. Turn, repent. But Christian, this is good news that the Mighty One has poured out in the world, the Holy Spirit, because it tells us that He has done what is needed to purify the world. He has done what is needed to purify you. He does not give you a list of an assignment to get busy doing so as to purify yourself. He has purified you. You are before him clean. And indeed, yes, we are to work out our salvation. Indeed, yes, There is a list of what holiness and righteousness is. The Spirit of God's job is to convict us of that and give us convictions about that. Yes, indeed, we are to work out our salvation. Finish the sentence in Philippians 2. For it is God who is at work in you by the ministry of the Holy Spirit to will and to work according to his good pleasure. If the second half of that sentence is not there, you have a long to-do list of futility. But you have an assignment to work out your salvation because God has done what is necessary to purify you. He has given you the Spirit. He has given you power. And He will make it plus one, even though there will be failures, failures and failures. He has done what is needed to purify the world and to purify us and to destroy all evil. It is very good news for those of us who long to be pure and long to be holy and long to be pleasing to him and long to know him more and to enjoy him more now and to see him one day forever. That God has done it, that God has secured it, that God has committed his spirit to it is great news. For those of us who long to see his name hallowed and his kingdom come here and his will done here, That which we long for will come to pass because the Mighty One has poured out His power to make it so. That is good news. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord has come and is at work. So as we look around and we see out there a world that's full of mess and in here a heart that's full of mess, we can rest and rejoice in the sure knowledge that the, glory, the, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will indeed cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, will indeed fill your heart full up because God is committed to it and God has done it. Marvelous thing in might he has done. That is good news. So people of God, What should you do from this? Well, you should rejoice. You should rejoice over this. Rejoice over it. And I think some appropriate response would be something that looks like or that feels like a yieldedness. Have your way. Mighty Spirit of God, change me. Some kind of posture like that in front of God is right and good for you. You want that.
But as I thought about myself, I thought probably the thing I most need, most consistently, is, I'm not sure if the word hope fits there, but it's the word that kind of comes to me. Probably the thing that I most need most consistently is hope. It's no secret I'm a glass that's half empty, two-thirds empty. And I most consistently see the problem first before the solution. See the, the bad before the good in myself and everywhere else. And to whatever degree you identify with that, in this moment or in general, this is good news because it is a mighty, hopeful promise. God wins. He wins in your heart. He wins in the world. The gates of hell do not prevail against him. The gates, that's the defense of a city. The defenses of hell do not prevail. He breaks them down. He overcomes. He wins. Good news. The Messiah is better than John because he is mighty and because the Messiah brings the Spirit to us who accomplishes the good purposes of God. So rest and rejoice. Yield to him, but rejoice in him. Let me pray. Lord, you have done great things. They are marvelous in our sight. And I pray that you would grow in your people. Rest and rejoicing. Grow in us faith that you actually are doing your good will. You are not remotely frustrated. You are not perturbed. You are not uncertain, quizzical about how it all turns out, how it works. What do you do? You are enthroned in heaven. You are at peace. You are delighted always. You know you win. Your kingdom comes. Your will is done. Hallowed is your name. So we pray, Lord, give us faith and hope. Grow in us assurance of that. Thankfulness for it. You are good. Your steadfast love endures forever. Thank you, Lord. Amen.